Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now, this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up, and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Ducks. Uh, what? Excuse me? Ducks? Ducks. She calls everyone ducks. Oh. It's really sweet. Ducks. I want someone to call me ducks. It is pretty cute. Today we're talking a movie from 2022. Available on VOD, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Did you know that this is based on a beloved book according to the trailer? That much you probably knew, right? No. Did you know that there was a 1992 film version featuring Angela Lansbury in the titular role? And it was titled... Mrs. Iris goes to Paris. No. Apostrophe A. Mrs. Iris. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Iris. Like in a Mary Poppins-esque. Yep. <laughs> like... <laughs> like in a Cockney kind of way, I guess. Offensive Cockney kind of way. <laughs> I, I don't know if she was Cockney in this one, but she was definitely, you know, she was working class. Do they call it blue collar in the UK? No, especially not in London. You know, in the high fashion, it's probably periwinkle. Periwinkle cravat. <laughs> you keep doing like the that? accent, right? <laughs> this is, I mean, at least I can kind of do a British accent. Kind of. Welcome to Woman's Movie September. Yep. Making up for all of that dude fatigue. <laughs> this movie's direct contrast with it. But I, I'm, I have a bone to pick with you, Wesley, my uh-huh. dear older brother. I really feel like you, personally, have ruined me for movies like Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Oh, yeah? I'm just going to say it. Have you transcended the rom-com genre? I don't have capacity to appreciate Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, and I blame it on you. Is it because you knew from the second we saw them that Clark and Lois were going to have their little bonk cute and like get together at the end? Bonk cute? There was no bonking in this movie. Yeah, they bonked their heads together. Oh. Not the British bonking. Well, I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking boinking. <laughs> They're bonk cute. Aww. And then they like zipped away on his little scooter. Yep. So romantic. Yeah, but it, so it's working on you. What's the problem? Okay, so I mean parts of it did, but did I find Mrs. Harris goes to Paris as grinning ear to ear charming as did our dear friend Amy Chafin? Or your dear fiance, Kelly Ray? She literally said, as the credits rolled, I don't think I stopped smiling that whole movie. Yeah, they loved it. And then, and, and Amy also spent hours looking for vintage Christian Dior dresses on, online. And you're just not in that place anymore? <laughs> you're, not, you're nowhere near <laughs> Mrs. Harris's age. What's the problem? I was just like, who is this movie for? And also... How does a movie like this still get made? Which is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong. But I'm kind of like, really? Like, there's nothing daring, dramatic, innovative. There's no major star power. Like, how does (gasps) Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris get made? How dare you? Leslie Manville of Phantom Thread fame? She was terrifying and awesome in that movie. She was also terrifying and pretty awesome in Let Him Go. Available now at (gasps) orwhatevermovies.com. Was she awesome 
and Mrs. Harris goes to Paris? Ask mom who this movie is for. This is a light moment for moviegoers to celebrate. Not post-pandemic, because we're still in the middle of it, but to be able to enjoy something, and especially for us, coming out of Dude Fatigue Summer. Dude Summer that was primarily characterized by Nick Cage. Who makes dude movies? This is a lark. And you need these moments to breathe, these movie moments to breathe uh, before we head into Halloween season. Because you're going to be like, I miss the Mrs. Harris goes to Paris days. You ready for my whimsical <laughs> throwback title? Go. Grandma Molly. <laughs> <laughs> Works, right? Uh, it was the inflection. <laughs> Grandma Molly. <laughs> I mean, it's been a it's been a minute, but <laughs> Amelie is all about a dream and like getting your way and design. Yeah. And she's like kind of running around on her own. I mean, she's got people in her life, but really it's just it's kind of her inner monologue. And similarly, Mrs. Harris has friends and suitors and business people that she works for in junk. Some of them horrible people. But it's just a glimpse of UK like Amelie was a glimpse of the Parisians. And she has her moment of exposition where she talks to herself slash her husband on the wishing bridge and stuff. What is it with old women and their need to just throw stuff in the water? Is this a Titanic reference? Yeah. It's like a cleansing, passing, ritualistic moment. Although I really was uncomfortable with how she hung everything over the side of the bridge all the time. <laughs> like it's one thing if you're committing and you're like ready to toss the thing in. But like until you're ready, keep it on the other side of the bridge, please. It's like not worth the risk. It's like Michael Jackson dangling blanket over the balcony railing. Let's go with just hanging your phone over a bridge for selfie. If you don't intend to throw it in the water, don't put it in a position where it can fall in the water. Exactly. She Before she even opened the box with the telegram, she was like unwrapping it and leaving it on the bridge railing. I was. It was like the most tense moment of the whole movie. <laughs> you found this movie tense? So weird. This movie was about her being transported by a dress. And uh, if you're not on board, like we talked about Mr. Malcolm's list and stuff, if you don't care about the intrigue or who's going to end up with what, uh, that movie and this movie are going to be a tough sell. Like my chromosome pre prevents me from being like, oh, the dress. And so I kind of don't care. Like fashion isn't a thing. And yet this is maybe the most I can relate to appreciation or love of fashion because she her whole life is about this dress it's fundamentally important to her the dress in a way of course represents uh you know the unattainable or whatever presumably based on her class but it's all she wants and it, it's the first time that something as dumb as a dress at an exorbitant like a ridiculous cost for her time and place in the world where it kind of makes sense because she's like going for it. And for the first time ever, I was like, I want Mrs. Harris to have that dress. <laughs> <laughs> of course we want Mrs. Harris to succeed. This, this movie is about the pursuit of a dream. However silly or subjective that dream may be, of course we want Mrs. Harris to get the dress. Although it seemed kind of risky to me. Like to pin your hopes and dreams on a thing that may or may not be attainable seems really risky and I thought that Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris was going to ultimately say it's not about the dress it's about the pursuit of it or it's about the friendships that you make along the way or something to that effect but really it kind of ended up being about the dress and maybe I would have gotten more on board with Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris if she thought it was about the dress and then she realized it was actually about feeling her best or looking her best as she goes through life or something more attainable. Lois tells her, you dare to follow your dreams, Mrs. Harris, and less about the dress and more about Mrs. Harris seemingly risking everything for something that was se was seemingly innocuous or inconsequential in the grand scale of her life. Like she wanted to go to the peach tree dance or whatever, and that was it. You know, then what happens? Then you hang it up in your closet in a laundry bag or whatever, and, and once in a while you, you stare at it in remembrance or whatever. But the whole point was that she was willing to basically leave her entire life in pursuit of something. The dress is the MacGuffin, and that was 
what it came to be about. Because I think Mrs. Harris, and by extension, Leslie Manville, is everything in this movie. Like her face and her earnestness and the sort of simplicity. And she was like Mary Poppins in, in that way because she was unfailingly sweet and kind and supportive and does the things that she wants without regard to consequence. And at the same time, she was like snapping people into shape and like not allowing for wrongs. You know what I mean? It's like this effervescent personality that that doesn't allow other people to be mean in her orbit. It's interesting that you say it's kind of all about the dress when I thought the dress was simply the device. It was, want to come, want to hear my, my other secondary title for this movie? Go. Harris Gump saves the house of Dior. <laughs> She's like a simple Harris working class Gump. type who like Stop. affects culture and like saves a major fashion house. That's true. There was real consequence to her pursuit that Dior basically goes mass market. We have Mrs. Harris to thank for being able to shop Dior in in Neiman Marcus. You Do you have, have. any Dior? <laughs> Do I have any Dior? You know what I found out? Um, you need a little luxury in your life, Wes. Way, way back in the day, I wandered into an Abercrombie and Fitch probably like... Wow. Just because I was waiting for someone or something. And I stepped you through the door. You get spontaneous abs. Well, whatever. And I was like just standing there and they approached me much like um, Isabelle Huppert uh, regards Mrs. Harris when she walks into uh, Dior. And like if there was an alarm button, they were would have been ringing it. They're like, can we help you? <laughs> And I was like, no, just looking around. And they were highly suspicious because of the dude that I am and the frame that I present. Because I don't think that they, that Abercrombie and Fitch, if it's still in existence, offers above a size medium. Like legitimately, do they offer size larges? Um, it's been a minute. So that's not, I I, do they even exist anymore? I, don't, <laughs> I think so. Either Abercrombie or not Lacoste. What's the other polo shirt? Polo? Um, <laughs> Ralph Lauren? No, 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 no. Dude, you're asking me about fashion. Paxson or Abercrombie or that other one. One of them went out of business. But go on. No, I'm just saying that that's how I... <laughs> so I'm not in a place where <laughs> fashion stuff appeals to me. I'm much more Zuckerberg. When I find a thing that fits and when I find a thing that works, I have like 13 of those things. I mean, you find your uniform, all great minds like find their uniforms eventually. It's a very attractive idea. The idea of, of having a uniform and just putting it on every day and it's one less thing to think about and one less decision to make. I'm down with that. I'm not, I'm not a fashionista. If I could wear a uniform, I would. But somehow I'm sitting in a closet full of clothes that I barely wear. I'd like a designer dress, but kind of more rent the runway style than like put my wedding dress in a dress bag in my closet for the rest of my life kind of way. The way that I want to make my way to wealth is to exploit some group of people or whatever who are silly. Like the idea that that bitchy lady gets her divs and gets her dress her way fitted for her until she drops out or commits a crime or whatever. Like selling that exclusive dress to her for $10,000 or something absurd in $50, um, that's the way to go. I mean, there's it's fashion, high fashion, avant-garde fashion is is so ridiculous. Those there's only one of them, and then they have to be tailored to size. But you never see it. Always makes me think of the I Love Lucy episode where they're wearing potato sacks, and because they believe in in, in its exclusivity, then they believe in its fashion uh, power. Yeah. yeah, it's like it all goes back to the emperor's new groove or the emperor's new clothes or whatever. It's called. <laughs> yeah, the emperor's new clothes. Right, definitely not the emperor's new groove. But I think it's interesting for you. It's interesting to bring up Lady Dant, who, yeah, I guess she and her husband commit some kind of fraud. Was this movie classist? I, I think absolutely it was. But because we're aligning ourselves, because we see ourselves in Leslie Manville's Mrs. Harris character, I think we were firmly on the side of the working class. It was more elitist in those other characters. I mean, I think that they absolutely look down on Mrs. Harris, but the movie doesn't. No, the movie certainly does it. But Lady Dant is clearly despicable. Um, e even the Marquis, though, he shows Ada Harris a certain amount of kindness is like really selfish. What did he say? Like he liked her because she reminded him of his cleaning lady. I thought that was going to be a misunderstanding. 
that he would clear and clear up and be like, no, you don't understand her. She was wonderful. And it's not a matronly thing at all. And then he was just too stuffy to ever correct that. And he was like, oh, I'll buy you a dress from afar, even though I'm never going to see you. And you're going to go back with Frank or whatever, who's been pining for you back in Philadelphia or whatever. No, it wasn't Philadelphia. It was, it was, where was it? It was like Surrey or, or Liverpool or something. <laughs> Yeah, one of those periwinkle cravat cities. And Kelly Ray knew, and and maybe you knew, but I thought that the Duke or whatever was going to score. I thought she was going to find her place and transcend. Because we didn't, she didn't transcend her her place. She didn't, it's not like she was whisked away pretty woman style because she was better than her class, you know? No, the Marquis was just a, was just a thing. And uh, once his motives were revealed, then she was like, peace, which was probably a good idea. She seemed, she, I felt like she didn't really give him an opportunity to explain, but he also had no explanation. He was just like, yeah, yeah. you remind me of, you remind me of this other lower class woman that I kind of liked once. We need some stakes. That was the end of act two, right? Yes, it was. And she was, she was pretty low. I think um, the dress gets destroyed like not too long after that. But even Claudine, the snobby Dior gatekeeper yeah. woman. Isabelle Huppert. Right. We get a glimpse that she is human, right? She has very human things that she's dealing with at home, caring for her husband. But there really is no redemption for her. Like, it's not like she's like, I was wrong and discriminatory. You know, it was just like, okay, I'm just going to accept you as being the pain in the ass that you've come to be. Yeah, um, she was in a defensive position. In House Dior. Right. She, this is, I mean, aside from her difficult personal life, Dior was all she had. And the institution was all she had. And she derived a lot of worth and power from it. And when we find out she's a real person and she gets knocked off her pedestal a little bit, uh, you know, we bring her down. And, and that she was the face of Dior and all its stuffiness and looking down mm-hmm. on Mrs. Harris. But ultimately, she was the bridge between what Dior really was, which was, you know, something that was struggling in its high level concept and had to adjust and being brought to uh, Mrs. Harris's sensibilities where we were going to open it up for everybody. I think uh, What's Her Nuts represented that. Claudine. Yeah, just the receptivity of Dior and and finally kind of knocking it off its pedestal in enough of a way so it didn't have to be ultra exclusive for six people. And when she when she broke and was reduced to Mrs. Harris's level, more or less, she softened. And so I, I liked her character in that respect. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60 percent on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Favel kind of took over. He was a harbinger of Christian Dior Next Gen, and he had Natasha by his side. And I thought he was going to end up with Mrs. Harris when he first rescues her. Young Hugh Grant, like, swoops out of the Paris night or whatever. When was that? I remember when Natasha motors up in her little sporty red car. Yeah, but he like rescues her when she's like off with the station troll. Yeah, why was she? I, at first I thought she was like humoring the station trolls. And then she was like, I'm going to just sleep here. I was, <laughs> did they drug her? Yeah. What happened? Oh, we'll see you in tomorrow. Why don't you sleep here next to me on the bench? No, they, it, it just demonstrates that Mrs. Harris is the hub for all classes. They're all just people, and they all deserve love. And when they have to be busted down a notch, in the case of Dior, she has no problem marching into Dior's office. Yeah, she does. That's when um, when she gets all bustly and, like, <laughs> intentionally meddly. I think that's where I was kind of like, mm. Yeah, when she got all mom. 
<laughs> it was it was like a nice supportive mom. It was like southern bossiness where it's still, you know, God, come on, get up. You obviously know what you're doing is wrong, and so please stop doing it. Come on, we have work to do kind of vibe. It wasn't mean. It was much more Mary Poppins taskmaster. Yeah, it was. The, I, I can see the Mary Poppins re- resemblance. And Mary Poppins is, um, she's so wonderful and delightful, but she's kind of a biatch, which Emily <laughs> Blunt took to like another level. She's not subject to flights of fancy or whimsy. She's a governess and thus must govern. Thus must govern. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think the key here is that Mrs. Harris doesn't change. Her life and circumstance changes, but she's absolutely the same person as a washerwoman than she was, with the possible exception that with less to lose and with a little bit of of justification for her confidence uh, because of what goes down in Paris, she can tell all the other bitchy, whiny people to to shove it or to, like, shape up, which she does. But I, I just think it is... An embracing of her power to say the things that she wants to say that otherwise would have gotten her sacked. Whereas now it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, but for a woman of practicality and common sense, she ex- exercises some pretty bad judgment in this movie. Well, she's out of her depth. Is she? Is it romantic or is it really a very bad idea to put your entire savings on haute couture, the haute couture dog in the greyhound races? Like, is that a good idea? Is it a good idea to lend your prized possession to a woman that you know to be irresponsible and kind of messy and untidy? This thing about in general, like if if Eric was like, hey, can I borrow your pants? I'd be like, dude, no. I don't understand the whole thing, but it's not as though she asked. (laughs) It's not as even as though Mrs. Harris had to consider the idea. Could I borrow your lovely, priceless, one-of-a-kind Dior dress? She's like, come on, you have a dress. You can borrow my dress. Let's get you in the dress. It it just was who she was. And I think it held as deplorable as it was and how, oh, my God, and how that, that note made me crazy. Just not even an apology. I'm fine. Your dress is ruined, but I'm fine. Not even a thank you. Not even a so sorry or whatever. Yeah. Not only not only was it like I'm fine, but it's like, no, really, I'm being taken care of because it was very traumatic for me. <laughs> like what? Yeah. But it was never a question. <laughs> Mrs. Harris, it was she was never not going to do it. She's going to help people. And in doing so, is going to help herself. That's her role. That's a helper. And, and, and when she needs to as a governess. But I didn't feel really any stakes i felt that it was maybe this is how the movie was ruined for me as well i didn't feel any stakes you knew from the second that she loves that dress and she's like she gasped and i was like oh that's the dress and then she's like (gasps) and she like fell down on the floor for the other one and then she didn't get it you're like well obviously she's getting that dress in the end right and so the placeholder dress that got ruined was just a means to get to the dress and the other dress, the the magi- I, I can't even venture a color because I'll be corrected. But that dress that Try. was not green, the red, <laughs> the red dress, <laughs> that red dress, we knew she was going to get it. And so there were no stakes or whatever. It was more about when the bad things, if you can call them bad things, are happening to her. The people were unrepentant and pretty terrible. And you're like, man, Mrs. Harris deserves more than this, so we have to wait 20 more minutes until she gets her due. Uh, So the point is she stayed the same, and she was the same person without the dress as she was with the dress, and then without the dress again, and then getting her dress back. She didn't really change. She didn't do the thing I expected, which is what Natasha did. Whenever women change their life, they have to get dumb hair. It signifies to change or whatever in movies, and Mrs. Harris didn't do that. (laughs) <laughs> Natasha got that little pixie. Didn't she go blonde and get a pixie cut Whatever, or something? Whatever, man. You got to do something. And, and and therein are the tropes that make romantic comedies or, I guess, female empowerment type movies so easily lumped into a category. And maybe how that's a bin in Walmart that you don't browse through anymore for the DVDs. I don't know, man. Okay, answer me this. You said something that made me think Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris is kind of inconsequential in the way, in the same way that the dress was the MacGuffin. But tell me, how is Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris any less consequential than the gray man? Is it because 
the gray man purports to save the world? <laughs> I guess. But I never felt that. And I don't care that Mrs. Harris did or did not save Dior. This wasn't a true story, right? It's, a fant it's fantastical enough that I assume not. In terms of how consequential this movie, I don't know. I don't really care care necessarily because it doesn't have to be a tight i mean mrs harris by definition her life takes these turns that we're not necessarily supposed to agree with because we're not her because very few of us are as fearless to be like my entire life savings do you know that that dior dress adjusted for inflation is like thirteen thousand dollars or something oh that's it maybe it was 30 i wrote it down or i saw it somewhere at some point <laughs> but the point is that it's absurd and nobody with her working class means should have been able to That's afford true. it but she makes these forrest gump pivots we're like oh it's a running movie now it's a ping pong movie now <laughs> and all of a sudden she's in paris and you know things are going to work out fine but in order to anticipate the nimble pivots i don't know that this movie would have had any weight if, you know, at least it did something that I wasn't sure was a good idea. And because of her conviction and just sort of wonderfulness, she can pull off. Maybe it was one of those things that we talked about with other movies way back in uh, Parasite. Remember we talked about people who have all of these skill sets and all of these proclivities that they would be really good if they applied themselves, but they don't have the circumstance. Mrs. Harris mm. maybe was meant to be in the Isabelle Cooper role and running a giant company like Dior in as much as that lady was just because it's common sense and kindness and rightness that governs her life and by extension governs the people that she governs as governess of Dior and uh, the people in her little London life. I can see how Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris is a parable for the universe conspiring to help you achieve your dream. Like if you set out on your mission all alchemist style, the universe is going to conspire to deliver you to your dream. It doesn't mean that it's it's not going to be without setbacks, but I mean, how else can you explain getting some of your money back on the Greyhound dog race? Or how can you explain winning the lottery, which, en which actually ended up not being that much money? No, but that's where the Amelie Forrest Gumpness comes in. How do you explain anything that happens fortuitously to Mrs. Harris? It's all about her delight and the whimsy in her life. And most specifically, when things happen to her, there is no sense of entitlement whatsoever. The, her only entitlement is her, be, her backing by what is right and what she believes is right and is going to impress upon other people. But when good things happen, she is unfailingly delighted and touched touched and moved there's no sense of of i this you know i'm finally getting my due it's just you know she's so happy she's like a like a hobbit with potatoes or mushrooms she's just so delighted in that moment whenever when when these things happen to her it's like watching like youtube reaction videos or reunions or whatever how could you how could you not love it you don't know or care about these people they're not you know particularly wealthy or, or or have any kind of real stature or place in our lives but you see them be happy and you're like so happy for them i was so happy for mrs Par harris and her going to paris oh i mean i objectively understand what's happening in Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. <laughs> and I objectively understand why Ada Harris is a likable character. I just feel like I've got, I've been desensitized and I have some kind of like Mr. Malcolm's List style heart shield around my little, my little heart that I, I just, I, I don't know what it was. I just never let it in. <laughs> All I these never let years, it in. I just, I just never let it in. You just throw your cigar into the ocean. I liked <laughs> Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris a lot more than Mr. Malcolm's List. I wouldn't say there were different movies. Thematically, they're different or whatever, but I, I think you're supposed to get the same effect. You're ultimately supposed to be happy. Uh, I remember Mom watching Amelie and, like, holding her, her fists up to her face and, like, going... Ooh! She was so excited at the love story and stuff. And I don't think we quite got that payoff in terms of love for Mrs. Harris. But I, I could see, I can picture mom having the same level of delight. We'll do it. I'll get her, get her to watch this movie. But I liked it more than Mr. Malcolm's List. And I give it a firm, a solid, all right rating. I don't care what you say. What do you say, though? Come on. Can I give it like Come an objective on. good and like a dark, shriveled heart? 
whatever. For your <laughs> your official a... review, I don't think can be bad. I mean, I really, I feel like, and maybe I'm just in a certain place in my life. I just, I, I'm glad that Mrs. Harris goes to Paris exists, and I hope to return to it in like 20 years. Yeah, and be just completely delighted by it. Nothing will change. I don't think it's like Tenet. It's the first time these movies have ever been compared. Like you won't even revisit Tenet because it'll just make you mad? I Well, that's like a three-hour investiture of time. I don't know that I have that much time at my disposal these days. I apologize to our listeners, especially the so-called sneak and the so-called pigeon. Sure. Who thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I ain't got nothing against Mrs. Harris. I wish her well. And I wish all dreamers well in their pursuit of their MacGuffin dreams. And hopefully they have a good time and are kind to people along the way. I mean, that's what I hope for myself, I guess. Yep. So good things from Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, but I do blame my inability to enjoy it now on you and the desensitization program that you've put me through. Look, I tried. With movies. Gird your butt, because horror is coming. Oh man, and that's a, and I think that's the takeaway for our listeners. Enjoy Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris while it lasts, because we've got quite the slate for you coming up in Halloween 2022. We'll be posting all of these reviews through the month of October. And enjoy 200 plus other episodes and movie discussions at orwhatevermovies.com or wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Thank you for supporting Or Whatever Movies on Patreon. And thank you for following us on social media. We always love to hear from you. 818-835-0473 or whatevermovies at gmail.com. Thanks again and au revoir. Or (laughs) cheers. Cheers is better, right? Yep. Electric acid. Welcome to the Candle Power Hour. Come with us backstage behind the scenes of show business spanning over four decades and bringing you the experiences that can only be told by the people who were there. Our guests are from the A-list, the F-list, and everyone in between. Get set for some of the most insane, hilarious, and inspiring stories you will ever hear. I'm Mercury. And I'm Diego. Your host for the The Candle Candle Power Power Hour. Hour. Hey, it's Tim from 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys, the comedy podcast you had no idea you needed. Join Ben, Jeff, and me as we continue our musical road trip back through the years and around the globe. See, just when you thought all white guys were like Joe Rogan, you come across three educators trying to remember when we were cool. 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys. Electric acid. Acid.